So, my name is Chandler Carruth, right? As, as I said, I'm, I'm the lead for Google's kind of C++ programming language platform. I'm also a developer on LLVM. Uh, and, and somewhat surprisingly, I'm going to talk to you about both LLVM and C++ at the same time. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. I uh, just want to just want to like ask like a quick couple of questions. How many folks here were at CppCon this year? Right. So that means that this conference is awesome. Okay. <laughs> because it's needed. Okay. So how many folks have watched some of the CppCon videos on YouTube? All right, all right, so YouTube is working. Good, I like that, I like that. Okay, now, now my big question, how many folks have watched a talk by me on YouTube from CppCon? Okay, so I hate to let you down, but like, like the, they, they, they do some of the magic when they're editing the video, it's not that good, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about LLVM and particularly uh, a modern kind of open C++ tool chain. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, I have some slides here, but I want to just like forewarn you, the slides are not the point of this talk. Most of this talk is going to hopefully be live demo, and, and we'll see how that goes. Um, all right, so without too much more ado, let's get started here. So, so how many folks here write C++, today, uh, C++ 11 for their day job? You actually write C++ 11, so you're using C++ 11 features. How many folks are actively using C++ 11 features in their day job? That's actually really good, that's really good. How many folks are using C++ 14 features in their day job? You notice my, hand, my hand's not up either. Um, okay, so that's, that's a little less good. Um, how many folks have started playing with C++ 17 features as part of their day job? Yeah, see, that's also not so good, all right? So unfortunately, there, there are a couple of things that, that this is gonna show us, is that C++ is actually taking off. Right, C++ is, is accelerating at a remarkable pace. You can see that because the standards are coming out at a reliable cadence. They're having lots of very, very interesting features. We're actually getting a, a broadening of the scope of the standard. Uh, it, it's amazing to watch C++ kind of accelerate in this way, but it's creating a problem. So how many folks could, in theory, like if they, if they typed the code it would compile, use C++14 as part of their day job. I'm not talking about like a hobby project, but like, right, like, like not very many people, right? And the problem here is that C++ tool chains are not accelerating at the same rate as the language is, okay? And that's a real problem. And this isn't actually because the tool chains are terrible. I, you know, I, I work on one of them. I know lots of people who work on C++ tool chains. They're all working incredibly hard to keep up with the language, but there's a problem. You don't have like any kind of C++ tool chain. How many folks here you work on Linux some of the time, or some variation of Linux? Right, like a lot of people. Okay, so let's look at Linux. Debian, GCC 6, not bad. Clang 3.8, for the record, Clang's on 5, okay? So if you try to use C++ 14 features with Clang 3.8, it's not gonna go very well. And if you try to use C++ 17 features with Clang 3.8, it's gonna go really badly. And this is Debian. Debian is the best. If we move to Ubuntu's LTS, we go back to GCC 5, and we're going back a couple of years now on the GCC side as well as on the Clang side. Right? We can go back further to Trusty, the previous LTS, that is still supported for another two years. How many folks work on a platform that uses Trusty as an LTS? Right? Like, th these platforms are out here, and we're talking about GCC 4.8 and Clang 3.4. This is not going to let you write modern C++, right? It's just, you, it's not whether you want to or not. You don't have the choice, right? And then there's my favorite Linux distro that I actually have some, some very good colleagues that work on, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, with GCC 4.8 and no Clang at all, right? I, this, it's awful. They actually have a really hard time. And this is interesting because this LTS release, at least, came out years ago, right? It, it's a long-term release. This Red Hat Enterprise Linux release with GCC 4.8 and no Clang came out this year, I think in April, okay? And it's this many years behind. And so this is the problem that we're facing, is that people don't have access to our tool chains. And that makes me sad, right? Because I like C++. I like where C++ is going. But I can't take C++ there if the tools don't come with us. We need to understand why this is actually happening, okay? The problem here is that we have stacked release cycles, right? You put out 
you know, you know my, 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 my colleagues that work on LLVM work really, really hard. After like six months or a year for GCC, they get a new major release. Great, fantastic. It's got tons of cool features. They ship it out the door. Great, no one uses it. Because then you have to wait another six to six months to end years for your distribution to do a release. If you're on LTS, this may be five years before your distribution does a release, right? And, and that's before you look at the problem of deploying the distribution. I, I have some, some good colleagues that work at Bloomberg, right? And one of their problems is they, they have to deploy a new version of their distribution with new tools across you know, infrastructure that's just not designed for it. And they have huge deployment challenges as a consequence, okay? So you have these stacked release cycles, and each one gates the next one, and so they add up really quickly, and this can add up to years and years of lag between the tool chain actually coming out with the features that we want people to be using, with the features that the C++ community is writing books, teaching students to use, right, and them actually being available in, in actual real production environments. And this is a huge problem for us, okay? And then you have another problem. What happens when you hit a bug? How many folks here have hit a compiler bug at least once in their career, right? A lot of hands go up. It turns out that, like, we're, we're going to get to that. But, like, what happens when you do hit a bug, right? You file it with your vendor, right? The GCC developers or the LVM developers or Microsoft or Intel, whomever your, your vendor is, they see the bug, they're like, oh, fantastic. We'll get right on it. Okay. So some years later, remember those stacked release cycles, you get a new tool chain with the bug fix. Well, that's, that's great. But like, then, then we have to like think about this, right? So, so the, that's actually not how it goes. We wait in years, we get a new tool chain, we start playing with it, we discover the bug, we report the bug, the tool chain developers go and fix the bug, but now we have a whole other stacked release cycle waiting for them to get the fix in our hands, right? You can be completely hamstrung in this process. Uh, Microsoft has one of the most impressive and aggressive tool chain release uh, cadences of any company I've seen, any vendor I've seen. They do an amazing job, genuinely. And we still have tons of problems. I, I work with the Chrome developers, and they have lots of problems you know, getting bugs fixed in a timely fashion. Right? And, and this, is, this is with one of the best tool chain development shops in the world. OK, so what are our options? Well, we could. Clearly, we just need to develop our tool chains in-house. That's fine. That's fine, right? I work at Google. I've got like a huge team of people. I work at Apple. I've got a huge team of people, right? Like this is not a problem. How many folks here work for a company like Google or Apple or Microsoft? Huge company. Got like thousands of developers. How many people? Come on, get your hands up. I got, I got one hand here. One. Okay, that, 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 that's not, that's not a good, that's not a good sign, right? Maybe we can't base all of our strategic decisions about how to develop tool chains around like three of the largest technology companies in the world. That might be a bad plan. Okay. So in-house tool chains seem kind of crazy. But there, there are more reasons than just the fact that like not everyone is a Google or a Microsoft or whatever, right? First off, you've got a bunch of tool chains that are closed source and proprietary. You can't bring them in-house if you wanted to. Unfortunately, Microsoft is going to continue to develop Microsoft's compiler. That's how it's going to work, right? Intel's going to continue to develop Intel's compiler, IBM, IBM's compiler. And so that's your first challenge, is that you may just not be able to bring the tool chain you're currently using in-house. OK. But maybe you grab an open source tool chain. GCC has been around for ages. It is kind of the, the poster child of open source compilers. It wrote, the, it wrote the book on it. It does an amazing job. But it is really hard to hack on if you actually want to, like, Build, how many folks here have downloaded and built GCC? How many folks here liked it? <laughs> yeah. See, see it's, it's, it's very painful. It's hard to actually stay up with that cadence. Plus, it's not just GCC. You need to get bin utils and GDB. How many folks here have built bin utils? Far fewer hands. How many folks here have built GDB? Yeah, no one. Right? Like, this is, this is, this is incredibly hard. Right? There's actually a whole project around this called cross -tool ng There are other projects that predate this one. Like, this is a huge problem if you're trying to package tool chains. Right? You, you, it's actually hard to do, even if you're, you're really dedicated to it. And then, of course, once you succeed, you get to debug miscompiles. And everyone loves debugging miscompiles. It's the easiest things to debug in the world. Right? Like, what could possibly be wrong here? OK, so the companies doing this today are huge and like throwing enormous resources at this problem. Right. And, and other companies are just not in that position. So building your own tool chain in-house, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's impossible. How many folks agree with this thesis? Everyone. 
OK, so let's do it live during the talk. I hope. OK, so, so here we go. We're going we're gonna to actually do this. So, so for the record, this is not running on my laptop. This is running somewhere else. Um, because if I tried to do this on my laptop, I think it would go very poorly. But we're, we're going to try. So uh, how many folks here have ever built LLVM? A few folks. Cool. How many folks here like, think they could actually come up here and build LLVM if they needed to? Like a few people? All right. Not bad. So, so in case you're wondering how live this is, I am actually Git cloning LLVM. OK? That, so, so that's LLVM. And, and LLVM comes in a bunch of pieces. We're going to talk more about what LLVM is and how it works. But it comes in a bunch of pieces. So we cloned the first piece of it, but that, that's not enough. We need, to, we need to clone some more pieces here. So we've also got you know, Clang. People probably want a C++ front end. Again, we'll talk more about that. Um, so, so those are the two really slow ones to get. But we also want some other pieces. So there's a tool called LLD. Um, oh, we also, we also want some fun things. So let's, let's go into Clang. So unfortunately, the, the LLVM project is kind of annoying to, to actually clone right now. This is something the project's working on to correct. Um, but until then, you have to put up with me you know, slowly typing up all of this stuff up here. But it's not, it's not too bad. So, so we're getting all of these different pieces cloned. Come on, come on, come on, internet, internet can't fail me. So we've got, we've got just about everything we need. And once we have all of this cloned, we're going to actually have to figure out how to build it. OK. So we've cloned all of LLVM now. And by the way, if you're wondering how I know just off the top of my head every single piece of this step, right? Like there's this wonderful getting started web page on LLVM site that tells you all of the stuff I'm doing up here. I'm, I'm mostly abbreviating it and trying to show you that this is actually something you can go back and do day in and day out. This is not, this is not going to be an impossible burden. OK, so, so once we have that, let's, let's uh, make a build directory, OK? So I've cloned all this stuff into this LLVM tree. Um, yeah. And, and now I'm going to try and build it. Now, LLVM uses CMake. How many folks have used CMake before? Sweet. OK. How many folks have used Ninja? OK, you should. So Ninja is this cool little tool that makes building stuff much, 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 much faster. So you take CMake from some build directory. Oh, i got to actually go into my build directory before I mess this up. I didn't mention this was live, right? So you take CMake. Um, I'm going to ask it to generate Ninja files. That's what this capital G Ninja is doing. And I point it at the place where I checked out LLVM. And, and CMake is going to do, and I'm using CCMake so that I can kind of show you how I'm configuring it, right? So the first thing you have to do is you have to scan all of the CMake stuff to collect all the configuration options. And there are a few configuration options that you do have to set if you really want to kind of build your own tool chain and have it be kind of functional and useful, especially if you're going to just turn around and actually build software with it, as opposed to going and developing LLVM itself. Uh, developing LLVM itself uh, is, is in some ways a little bit easier out of the box. At 95%, OK. So, so the very first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're actually building a release build because we would like our compiles to be you know, quite fast, hopefully. Um, so, so we don't want a debug build. We want a release build. We need to install this somewhere. Uh, I have kind of a weird way of managing stuff. Um, so we're going we're gonna to install this here. I want to remember what day it is, the 25th. All right. So let's, let's install it there. And the other thing we're going to need to do, and, and I, I do apologize for this, I have to turn off a batch of tests here. Um, and if you actually try this on like a Linux workstation, you'll find that these tests are, they're finicky. Um, so we're going to turn those off briefly. They're not strictly necessary to get a working tool chain. We're going to go way, way, way down in all of these configurations. And we're going to turn off, and this one's kind of surprisingly important, LLVM enable assertions. By default, uh, the, the LLVM tool chain builds in a way that's very developer friendly, like LLVM developer friendly, and not necessarily in the way that users would expect it. So we have to switch to release build. We also want to turn off assertions because they tend to be very expensive. We want a nice, snappy, fast compiler. And once we've done this, we can rerun all the CMake configuration. Fortunately, it runs a little bit faster the second time around. Hopefully, hopefully, there we go. And we can generate ninja files. Okay. 
So this, this is going to go and generate some ninja files. Uh, this, the, the ninja files are kind of like make files, uh, right, for folks who haven't used ninja before. Um, ninja is very similar to make in that you wouldn't really want to write your build system in ninja files, but it makes for a great execution and, uh, engine for your build files. Okay, so now we've got that. And now we just want to build the world. So this might take a little while. Why don't we, why don't we do something else while we're waiting for this? Uh, not that way. Direction? This direction. Okay. So while we're, while we're you know, carrying on with this fine, fine game, let's talk a little bit about LLVM. How many folks here know a lot about LLVM? Like, they don't even tell them anything about LLVM. Yeah, see, that's a thing. So, so LLVM is an open source project. It's a modular collection of kind of compiler and tool chain infrastructure. Um, it, it actually includes a lot of stuff for generating code, executable code, for doing compiler optimizations, for doing linking, loading, online compilation, profiling, uh, just, just a world of different, different stuff. It even includes uh, front ends uh, for, for various programming languages. Right? And one of the nice things is that, of course, LLVM is written in C++. Right? It's not in this like, mysterious other language. It's actually fairly accessible if you're working in C++. And you can do a lot of stuff with this. Uh, you, can, uh, generate, you can do code generation for domain-specific languages. Uh, if you've ever heard of Halide or XLA, uh, which is the TensorFlow domain-specific language um, for machine learning, these things actually are starting to use LLVM to kind of generate their code and execute their code which is really powerful, it's a really powerful technique. It means that you don't have to be responsible for like, like figuring out how to execute on a machine, you just do something very high level, hand it off to a pile of infrastructure, it runs off and it does wonderful things for you. But you can also build kind of traditional compilers on top of this. Um, and, and in fact, you know, we, we have, you know, Clang is a C++ compiler that's actually part of the LLVM project, but there are a lot of other compilers out there. There are front ends, uh, kind of like really high quality, production quality front ends uh, for Rust, for Swift, for um, uh, Julia, for Java, right? And, and they're starting to be kind of in development front ends for Go and for Python and lots of other languages, all of them targeting LLVM. So it's, it's very adaptable to different languages. And there, there are also kind of other things you can build on top of compiler infrastructure, um, such as developer tools or editor tools, right? So you can get uh, tab completion, semantic aware tab completion, static analysis, refactoring, like you name it. Like it's really a collection for all of these kinds of, of tools and a platform for building them. And Clang, perhaps though, is the most interesting for this audience because Clang is the C++ front end uh, in LLVM itself. Okay, but I want to reemphasize something because it's, it's, it's actually incredibly important. Um, LLVM is actually still just C++ software. I mean, it, it, it happens to be a lot of C++ software, but it actually is just C++ software, okay? And this has some important implications for people. So first off, LLVM does in fact have bugs, much like other software. Uh, I, I like to tell people that, you know, no, it's not the compiler, it's not the compiler, it's not the compiler. But it is important to understand that compilers are just like other pieces of software. They have bugs, right? But there are also other implications, right? If compilers are just pieces of C++ software and you work in C++, that means you can actually hack on LLVM pretty easily, right? If you write C++ code today, you have the important skills necessary to work on LLVM, to change LLVM, to make LLVM do whatever it is that you want. Uh, the other kind of really nice aspect of LLVM is that it is open source. And that means that it comes with a community. And the LLVM community is amazing, in my opinion. I'm, of course, slightly biased here. But, but it is a huge community. They are very, very interested in helping you. And so if you need something, if you want to change something, the LLVM community is actually going to really you know, foster that and encourage that and help it out. So are there, are there kind of questions about LLVM before we go back to, to building LLVM itself? Does anyone have questions? Does everyone now feel like they know what LLVM is? Because when I asked this question earlier, it was just like no hands went up. Yes? So with that open source community, is there some sort of process for submitting ideas about how to improve it rather than just, okay, I'm just going to go out and chuck some stuff up? Uh, so, so the question is, is there, is there a good way to, to kind of uh, get ideas around how to improve LLVM, how to, how to contribute in, in effective ways? Yeah, so, so, so it, is, it is an open source project and it does have some, some review, but it's, it's very lightweight and it just resembles kind of code review um, and, and discussion. Uh, nothing like the JSR. Uh, the, uh, 
The other side is there also are, are resources. There's an open projects page. It's somewhat perpetually out of date, but it can give you good ideas. And if you, if you, you know, reach out to the community and say, I'm looking at this one, they'll kind of give you any like, missing information, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's go back and see how we're doing here on our build of LLVM. So somewhat magically, I have timed it so that we finished building LLVM during that period of time. Um, purely by, by coincidence. But I, I do want to be clear, like, like, I actually just built LLVM. You can even kind of see it here, right? Like it says, this took four and a half minutes to build, right? Um, so, so it happens that I have a very fast machine that I'm doing all of this on in order to make this not horrifically boring to the entire audience and, and run out of time very quickly. All right, so, so now we have, now we have this, this lovely compiler. We need to you know, probably do something with it. And this is actually an, uh, a step where I find a lot of people get, get hung up. They, like, they build LLVM, great, wonderful, but what do I do with it to actually like, install it and use it, right? Unfortunately, um, Ninja has our back, right? We can simply type Ninja install, and if we run it, it's gonna go off and install a bunch of things. Now, I, I was weird, right, and I installed it off in a separate tree. Um, and so, so in order to kind of, you know, do anything really useful with it, I need to, to kind of merge it in with the rest of my tree. There's this cool little tool um, called Ellender. Uh, and if we go and we find our lovely, lovely thing here. No, 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 not the backups, because live demo, it can go wrong. There we go. So, so if I take the one that I literally just built today, right, and I, and I kind of symlink it in, this is gonna create my nice symlink. And now I have a Clang binary, right? I just for the record, right, like I, I really did just like get check it out. This is this is top of tree. It's top of tree, okay? And this is actually an interesting thing for LLVM. A lot of other uh, uh, tool chains don't operate this way. LLVM operates in a, in a mode where the, the top of the tree is always intended to be release worthy. Um, we, we, are, we are very, very serious about kind of continuous integration with, with the LVM project. We revert to green very aggressively. It is not a crazy thing to use the top of tree. You will sometimes get you know, versions that are bad, but not especially often. And, and very typically, they, they are bad in ways that manifest right away. You notice it. You don't have to wait. It's, 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 not, it's not a super bad thing to debug. Um, and there are a bunch of us, a bunch of people using LVM in this way. And so, so you're not kind of off on your own doing this. Okay, so now we have, we have a compiler, right? But what can we actually do with it, right? That's kind of the very first question. So the very first thing I like to point out that we can do with a compiler is uh, we can do some, some very nice things with C++ 17. So I have, I have a little uh, demo here of C++ 17 stuff. And just like, there's, there's nothing up my sleeve here. Like, this is the Clang binary I just built. Okay, so, so I just built this one. And we're gonna hope, hopefully this is, this is all gonna work pretty well. Um, so, so let's see, what do we have here? So first thing I wanted to show people is one of my favorite C++ 17 features um, called uh, uh, initialization, I don't know, it, uh, it has a really funky name. But let, let, let's take a look at it. So, so here we have this, this code. And this code is, is not C++ 11 or even 14 code, this is actually C++ 17 code. And we have this weird thing inside of an if, okay? We have a declaration of a variable that is initialized inside of the if, and then we do a semicolon, and then we do some expression that, that actually is used as the condition, right? And this separates the declaration in an if from the actual condition expression, which is great, because maybe success is not zero. Maybe success is some random number. We don't know. We want to be very explicit about what we're testing for here. And now we can write that, we can write that code. And this actually compiles in C++ 17. So if we go back, we can compile this. Uh, I don't need to output this. Say what? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got ahead of myself, because I have some, some demos which, which are not this. But I probably do need to actually turn on C++ 17 mode. All right? compiles, no problem. Right, so Clang is actually parsing this. And, and, and this, this feature is a little bit fancier than you might imagine. So uh, we, we can look at some of the other things this feature can do. Come on, come on. Uh, so, so you can also do kind of crazy things like this. So here is, here is a class, right, which has an enum inside of it, okay? 
And inside of this, we have, we have a bunch of error codes, right? We have a getter that accesses this, this, this uh, EDUM status code out of the class. And inside of a switch, we can use the same pattern here. We can, we can take this result, right, and we can actually capture it a, a, into a condition variable as part of the switch, right? And then we can use it immediately inside of the switch. And this variable is alive for the entire switch. So we can, you know, we can even go down here and we can even go down here and we can return, you know, a copy of this variable. Make sense? Really nifty feature. And right like this, this, this of course, you know, also compiles just fine with Clang. Right? So you've got C++ 17 features. So now you can start playing with C++ 17 features, right? But, but just, just a compiler isn't really enough to play with C++ 17 features. A lot of the 17 features that you may be most excited about come in the standard library, or at least need some amount of standard library support, okay? And so uh, I'd like to, to, to first look at kind of another C++ 17 feature. Uh, this one might be even more exciting than, than these initializer, uh, initializers and conditions. So this is called structured bindings. How many folks here are familiar with structured bindings, right? So if you're not familiar, this is, this is in my, my, my opinion, actually, like the marquee feature of C++17, which seems really silly because it's a totally silly feature. It, it's pure syntactic sugar. So all this lets you do is take a pair or a tuple returned by some function and declare multiple names for each of the components of that pair or tuple in a variable declaration and then initialize it and it like binds the names to, to that particular structure. And it's very fancy, it works with pairs and tuples, it even works with like normal looking structs, it even works with structs that contain bit fields, although that's, that's, that's really, that's a bit dicey, uh, but, but it works, right? And it lets you do wonderful things like this. So I have auto and then these square brackets. And the square brackets after an auto introduce a structured binding. And then I have a sequence of identifiers in here. And these are the names that are bound into the structure of the return value. So we've got an iterator and an inserted, right? And this is so that when I do a map insert, map insert returns both an iterator and a Boolean indicating whether or not we inserted the thing. And because I've kind of captured these two things in this structured binding, I can then use the previous feature to extract the Boolean as the condition, right? So now I, I have this Boolean condition instead of having to like do some crazy dance, right? And then if it's true, right, if we did insert it, we can actually process it the first time and we can use the iterator inside of this condition. Make some sense? Crazy cool feature, love this feature. Now this feature works pretty well with Clang and kind of most standard libraries. So, so you can actually compile this in C++17 mode with Clang, no problem. But if we get a little bit fancy with this feature and with some other features that are coming in in uh, uh, C++17, thing, things start to fall apart without a standard library. So, so if I look at a fancier version of this, which actually uses another kind of library facility called StringView, and StringView is essentially a better, a better option than you know, a, a const reference to a string because it can look at a piece of a string, it can be a view that moves around on a string. But once I have a string view here, this isn't going to compile anymore. I also have try and place below, and, and try and place is, is a new kind of API on map that allows you to kind of lazily call the constructor for, for a map element only if it was necessary, right? And this can be very nice. In this example, I'm using it to avoid allocation, right? But it can be even more nice if you have something like a unique pointer or a, a, a lock a scoped lock, a unique lock, where you actually can't arbitrarily copy or move these things necessarily, you can actually construct them in place here, and only construct them in place when they're needed, uh, which, is, which is a very nice facility. But at this point, we, we we're using too much of the kind of standard library facilities of C++17, so if you actually go back and try and compile this with Clang, it, it's not gonna work so well. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna like complain us. It's like, the, I don't have this string view thing that you're talking about. But this is, a, this is one of the nice things. We didn't just get a compiler. We actually got a tool chain. And so you can pass a flag here called studlib and ask for a different standard library. And I'm gonna ask for libc++, which is the standard library that ships as part of LLVM. And libc++ has 
pretty robust C17 support, and so I can compile this with libc, compiles no problem, right? So this is the first time we're starting to move beyond the scope of just a compiler and into kind of other tools. Making some sense? Yeah, I didn't have libc installed at all anywhere on this machine. So, so yeah, this, is, this actually has to use the one I just installed. Like, there, there, there isn't one. Like, uh, uh, like, if I try and go to user bin clang, like, doesn't exist. Oh, yeah, well, of course that one doesn't exist. It's like, there's no clang on the system, right? There's no libc++ on the system. Um, and so it's actually finding this in include uh, C++, right, v1. So that's, that's where it's finding the, this header, right? And here's string view, <coughs> right? And I don't have a user include. Nothing there. Nothing up my sleeve, promise. Like, it's, it's real, it's real, okay. So, so great, C17 is wonderful. If you want to know more about C17, there's a great talk, oddly, at this conference, I think later today, about std variant, which is another great standard library feature that's coming in, in C17. You should absolutely go and attend that talk. It'll be fabulous. Um, but let's, let's move on to some more interesting things. How many folks here, so, 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 so we mentioned that, that with LLVM, you don't just get a compiler, right? You don't just get Clang, which is a compiler. It's nice, it's important. You also get a standard library. You don't just get these kinds of pieces of the tool chain, though. You also get some developer tools. So how many folks here have used Clang format? Sorry, I should ask this the other way. How many folks here have not used Clang format? It's okay, you can admit to it. Okay, so all of you that raised your hands just now, you have homework. <laughs> Go use Clang format. I'm not kidding, it's more important than Clang. Okay, it will be the single largest improvement in your productivity as a developer you will have in the next five years at least, guaranteed. Money back, or, like, or your money back. Sadly, it's free, but guaranteed all the same. So, so, so let's, let's play a little bit with Clang format since not everyone has used it. Um, has, has everyone seen, has anyone not seen what Clang format does? Anyone not familiar with what Clang format does? It's okay to raise your hands. Okay, yes, there are people who haven't seen it. So we'll really quickly uh, look at this. So, uh, let's let's jump right to the let's jump right to the the fun part of this this demo. So so here is some code. How many folks have code that looks kind of like this, right? Like like got some platform variants because you got different types on different systems, right? Like it's kind of ugly and gnarly to maintain, right? Like like I've got lots of code that looks like this. It's not it's no fun. So 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 Clang format is fundamentally a tool that formats your code automatically. So, so for example, if I were to come in here and like change this name to a really long name um, and change this one to a really long name, right, like I would, I would, I would eventually run out of columns here. So, so how many folks here uh, believe in 80 columns as the one true column width? How many folks here? Right, right, okay. There, there, there are some people who are correct. Um, but whatever your column width of choice is, like no judgment, whatever your column width of choice, I mean you're wrong, but no judgment. Um, Use, oh, sorry, it's, it's really fast. So you use Clang format, and there's, I have like a, there's a Python script that comes with Clang format that you can bind to whatever editor you want, like Vim integration, Emacs integration, I don't, I don't care, I'm not gonna pick a fight there. I mean, Vim is also the right answer, but I'm not gonna pick a fight there. So when you've got this like too long line, right, you just mash a button, and if you look at the bottom, you'll see it run, right? It runs a Python file through Clang format, and it wraps the line, right? Because it understood, oh, you, you went past the line. And it knows that in an argument, List and so it knows where to indent things to and it lines them up nicely, right? And if I if I if I was just really 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 just determined to to, to you know make this make this code look horrible, which I would I would never want to do of course in real life. But if I like if I just keep going keep going keep going right, it'll even it'll even like really work hard to restructure. But but hold on hold on this did something more impressive. So back up a second. So. Before, we could actually fit everything nicely indented to that open parenthesis, but after we made this too long, that doesn't work anymore, so we have to re-indent uh, to kind of get some more columns. But there are other parameters, and worse off, there are parameters inside of macros alternating between options. But when I run Clang format, it's going to format both sides of the macros simultaneously to like line stuff back up, right? It's pretty, it's pretty nice, right? Like, like, like reformatting this by hand would have been a real pain, right? But it gets better than that. 
so, so the classic uh, uh, kind of uh, thing, I, I show this to lots of people, and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 that's nice, that's nice. But, but, if you do this, right, there's no way it's going to be able to handle it because now I have mismatched braces, okay? This is impossible. You can't, you can't do this in an automatic tool. I mean, like, my editor can't even syntax highlight this. You're not going to be able to restructure the code. Um, unfortunately, Clang format is, is uh, very, very, very persistent, and it doesn't care. And so it, it happily just reformats the code. So Clang format actually can understand the, the semantics behind the preprocessor well enough to understand alternations. And so it understands that, in fact, the parentheses and the curlies match here, but along alternations. And so it can reformat them accordingly. Right? And like, it's, so, OK, so, so one more quick. So I, I love Clang Format. I could demo this to you all day. It's just, it's just the best tool in the world. So, so there's one more thing that I, I have to show people because this one also. So how many folks here have like some horrible macros that look like this? It's OK. I, I have lots of these, right? Like, it's, it's fine. Right? But how many folks really like my, my backslashes on the right-hand side, all nice and tidy on the right-hand side there? Anyone like that? I really like that. It makes me happy. It makes my OCD self happy. But unfortunately, I have these code reviewers in LLVM who make me do this stuff where they're like, you really need like, some kind of message with your assertion. So I have to write them. I'm being sarcastic. I actually really like, like assertion messages. But now I've got a problem. So I actually have multiple problems. So, so problem number one, I have a string literal that's way too long. Problem number two, I have an assert, which is its own macro. Inside of a macro definition, that's a multi-line macro definition that uses the backslashes that like line everything up. And I've just wrecked it. Unfortunately, or fortunately for me, Clang Format doesn't care. So I mash a button and Clang Format fixes it. So Clang Format understands how to like stitch together string literals, understands how to like line them up with the double ampersand, and it also understands that you're inside of a multi-line macro definition, removes a couple of lines from your column width so that it can line up the backslashes for you, and it, may, it does all this for you. It, it's a magical tool. Okay. So, so, so hopefully I've convinced you to go and use Clang Format. The reason I spend time on this every time I come up and, and do this and people say they, haven't, they aren't using it is because it seriously is the largest productivity boost you will find in your day-to-day -day programming. It is, it is absolutely amazing. You don't realize it. I didn't realize it. I actually argued against the team building this tool, for the record. Uh, and they told me I was an idiot, and I, I disagreed with them. And then they built it anyways, and I said, like, you're wasting your time. And then they gave it to me, and now I can't write code without it. So, so there you go. All right, so, so that's nice. Let's move on to some other tools. So Klein doesn't just give you formatting tools. It's kind of a simple thing. It also gives you semantic tools that I think are sometimes more interesting. So let's look at one of those. So if we look at, uh, let's, let's get a, a new window here. So if you look at uh, this, some source code here, uh, like range four is a good example. So how many folks wrote code like this? Because this is the only way you could write it before C++ 17, or C++ 11, right? Like iterators all over the place, giant iterator types all over the place. It's awful, it's terrible, it's bad. We all know better now, wonderful, but you probably have a lot of code that still looks like this, right? It, it's kind of tedious to go and update all of your code. Well, tedious things that can be tricky, that is what tools were made for, right? I, I strongly believe in the power of robots to rewrite all of my code. So there's a tool called Clang Tidy. And Clang Tidy is a very, very fun tool. It's essentially all of the fun C++ uh, uh, you know, idiom checking and, and kind of linting and, and tidying that you might want a compiler to do, but really has no business being in a, in a compiler. Because it's not that your code's right or wrong, right? It's that it didn't follow some style guide somewhere or whatever. You don't want that in your compiler, but you still want a tool to handle it for you. And, and Clang Tidy is exactly that. It's a pluggable platform where you can just come in and drop in new checks, new diagnostics, and even, even new refactoring, uh, refactorings to kind of adapt your code to some style guide or some rules. And so, so uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you can type correctly, you see how it even, it even, it even helps me type help, because it's, it's a very helpful tool. So if you type help on this, you'll find that the help is extensive and exhaustive. I don't want to like, we can scroll through all of this, but it's not super fun. Um, but there's some, there's some important things to look at here. So, so 
the first thing that's kind of important to look at is if I could actually know my alphabet, list checks. So list checks to Clang Tidy says, what can you, what, what facilities do you have? Remember, this is a pluggable architecture, so, so you, you might want to check what's available from it. So if we run Clang Tidy, list checks, it's going to list a whole lot of checks. Well, that's too many, so. Oh, come on. Fine, fine, fine. Why, why can I not remember this? So, so, oh, because it has a capital M, probably. So somewhere, somewhere buried in here, there, 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 there are these wonderful, wonderful checks for, uh, where are they? Where did they go? <laughs> That's better. The, pro tip, pro tip. It's live demo, so apparently I didn't get these checks installed in my Clang Tidy. I don't even know how. But let, 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 let's, let's, let's still take a look. So if we run Clang Tidy over, your, over our source code, which isn't too hard, you can run it much like a compiler does. Uh, so, so we can just uh, find this, so range four. We also need to give it some compiler flags, otherwise it's not gonna know what we're trying to do. So let's say, you know, nice modern C++ standard. Uh, Right, so if we run it over our code, it's actually very happy because it's missing the modernization check. Well, th this live demo isn't gonna work. Anyways, <sighs> sorry, Clang Tidy though has these delightful modernization uh, checks that if I, if I were more competent at building Clang Tidy would, would have worked for me. Uh, but let, let's, you should try out Clang Tidy. There's also tons of documentation about Clang Tidy. It's one of the only tools that's actually really, really well documented in Clang. I, I'm really proud of the team. They, they did an amazing job of documenting this. And there's some great talks just about Clang Tidy and how to even extend it with your own custom tools. But that's enough, that's enough kind of these boring tools. Let's, let's move to more fun and exciting tools, such as how many folks here are familiar with the LLVM sanitizers? A few folks. So, so who here has not heard of address sanitizer? Okay, so when you finish learning about Clang format, your next assignment is address sanitizer, okay? Seriously, the big, biggest debugging tool uh, help you'll ever have. So let's, let's see if I can at least get the address sanitizer demos to work for you. All right, so address sanitizer is often abbreviated ASAN. And so we have a little bug here. So this, this, this unfortunately, I have to show you a little bit more code than I have been. So we have a few things going on here, right? We have a hello and a world consexpr array of characters, right? Very modern C++. We're using consexpr, right? We're, we're good here. We have this uh, really lame function called copy hello and a really lame function called copy world, which managed to copy these arrays into some output buffer in hilariously different ways. And neither of these functions is inherently wrong. These, these functions are fine, right? Like, Questionable coding practice, but fine, right? And then we have a main, and this main is very helpful. It actually has nice comments, right? It points out what we're doing. So, so we're gonna we're gonna create a buffer of 11 characters for our hello and our space and our world, right? And then we're gonna copy the hello into it. We're gonna copy the space into it, and we're gonna copy the world into it. And we're gonna print it out. How many folks here see the bug? Don't don't say if you see it, but how many folks here see the bug? A few folks here see the bug already. So this bug just drives me nuts. So this code will essentially always work, unfortunately. Like, like, it'll, it'll, like, it'll basically always work, which is really frustrating because there is, in fact, a bug in this code. But tools can come to our aid here. So if we, if we take Clang and we go and we build this code, give it a nice modern thing, right? Just, just like, see, it works. There's a bug, works fine, right? But, but we, can, we can turn on some cool features with Clang. So there's a flag called F sanitizer. And to turn on address sanitizer, you say address to it. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> I have a plant. So, so you f sanitize equals address, there you go, and now, now we have this thing. And now when we run this, it's gonna give us a very different answer. Whoa, okay. So it, so it failed, but let's, let's look at what it actually told us, because this, this, is, this is perhaps more interesting. 
All right, so, so ASAN prints out a lot of uh, error messages to try and help you here, but it's, it's great. Okay, so address sanitizer found a stack buffer overflow. Okay, so this is, this is like a scary bug, right? This is actually a security bug uh, in a lot of contexts, right? This is, this is probably the second or third most common source of security bugs in modern C++ software, right? Stack buffer overflow. It tells us there was a write into the stack buffer of size one, gives you the stack trace at which that write occurred, it occurred inside of copy world. But then it goes further. It actually says that the, the address is located in the stack of our main function. And then it goes a little bit further and says, by the way, that function has a stack frame consisting of several different objects. One of them is my buffer. It says the memory access at offset 43 overflows the variable, right? Because like, this, this doesn't go to 43. This only goes from 32 up to 42. Right, what, what's wrong here? What's wrong here? Anyone see the bug? Who's got it? The, the, ending the ending isn't there, right? I need that null byte, and I didn't allocate enough space for it. And ASIN is very, very clear, and it says you, you overflowed your buffer by one. Debugging this with ASIN is fabulous. Debugging this without ASIN is miserable. Because like I said, it always works. Until, of course, it doesn't, but like almost always works. All right? And the output is really fantastic. It even goes on, so it even shows you kind of a visualization of the memory around this address. And you can kind of see the square brackets here that say, like, here is where the access happened, right? And, and there's, there's a key at the bottom, like, for what all of these, these, these values mean. And you can literally see there's the region of memory that, like, we accidentally touched, right? And, and the region, and right next to the region that we were allowed to touch, right? Amazing, amazing tool. Okay, so, so that's async. But not all bugs look like addressing bugs, right? Async can catch, by the way, a host of other bugs, use after free, use after scope, Heap buffer overflows, all kinds of bugs. It, it, it is easily the, the, the largest uh, or the, the most prevalent way to find bugs that we've ever found, right? Uh, uh, it, it dwarfs every other tool we have to kind of check the correctness of your code. And so again, like once you finish looking, looking up Clang format, look up ASIN. Okay. But there's, there's, some more, there's some more fun tools here as well. So what if you have uh, not an address bug? Oh, one other thing I should mention. Uh, uh, folks may be familiar with Valgrind, which often catches similar bugs. Valgrind can't catch the bug I just showed you, because Valgrind doesn't understand your stack. Valgrind can only catch bugs on the heap, and it has less precision. And so, so, so even, even if you were using Valgrind, ASIN is going to be a very significant improvement because of its stack visibility. And Valgrind has very limited visibility into the lifetime of objects, again, especially on the stack. And so things like use after scope or use after a turn are completely missed by Valgrind but they're caught very reliably by async. Okay, but Valgrind helps us with another cl class of bug, which is use of uninitialized memory. And async actually doesn't handle that. For that, you need a different sanitizer. So here we have a trivial example of use of uninitialized memory, right? I think everyone will agree that that's, right? Everyone agrees this is uninitialized memory. We're using it, bad idea. But we want, we want some way to catch this, and so we, we can catch this as well. So, so we can come in and do insan bug. And here you have to say f sanitize equals memory. And then when you run it, you're gonna get a similar message to what ASAN gives you, right? Use of uninitialized memory, gives you a stack trace. There's some flags to msan to get similar functionality from Valgrind in terms of tracking the origin of allocations, that kind of thing. There's lots of uh, options here. One disclaimer I do have to mention is that msan is a little bit trickier to set up. For msan to work very reliably with larger code bases, you actually have to make sure that all of your code is instrumented by msan. So you have to build all of your code with that f sanitize flag. And this is harder than you might think. That includes your standard C++ library. That includes all of your dependencies, right? And so that can be really challenging. Um, and and when, when it's too challenging, Valgrind may be the only realistic option for catching uninitialized memory because it doesn't have that limitation. But, but me memory sanitizer tends to be much more accurate and a lot faster if you can actually get your code to compile. Uh, there's work ongoing so that when you install the tool chain, the way I just showed, you'll get an msan version of the, the standard library, but I don't think that that's landed yet. I don't know, Dean, if you remember, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think this is landed yet. This is still somewhat in flux. But ho hopefully we'll at least get the standard library out of your way, and then it'll just be kind of your dependencies that will have to be built from source with this instrumentation in order to use the facility. Okay, but there's one more, one more tool I wanna very briefly show you here, and this is called tsan. 
So how many folks here write multi-threaded code? Fair handful, okay. How many folks have written a race condition? Everyone who's written multi-threaded code, right? <laughs> yes, like multiple at the same time. It, it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, so how can we actually fight this? So here is, an, an, and unfortunately, in order to show you multi-threaded code, my examples get a lot more complicated. Uh, nothing I can do here. So here is my horrible, awful, terrible, bad shared pointer. Don't ever write this code. Seriously, I know you can take photos of my code. This is bad, 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 bad. So, so this says, like, you know, this, this is, is the classic shared point. I mean, all of, all of this stuff is just, you know, counting and deleting when the count goes to zero. All that's normal. The real problem here is my shared state. I have an int in my shared state. This int is going to be incremented and decremented by different threads at the same time. That's a race condition, okay? It's, it's, it's actually a quite bad race condition. And so then I write some code down here to, like, get and, and, and a main function and some threads, right, and some lambdas. And so I'm just going to create this shared pointer, right? And I'm going to, you know, like, like access it from different threads at the same time. And then we're going to join the threads and, and, and talk about the values that I write out, right? There's not too much craziness going in here. But I do have this reference count, right, that is a raw int being incremented and decremented to keep track of the reference count. So the first thing I, I always like to do here is just, just you know, what happens if we actually just compile this code? So this is like bug zero. And so the, this, this, this is an interesting piece of code to compile because if I actually turn on optimizations, uh, this, this may not manifest in the way you would expect. Uh, helps if I turn on threads. So now I have my threads, I run this, and it works. Like, I can run this as many times as you want. It's always going to work. Because I happen to be running on an x86 machine, I happen to have turned on optimizations. By chance, I happen to know that my compiler, when optimizing an increment of an integer, turns that into an atomic operation on memory in the x86 uh, instruction sequence. But like, I never had a guarantee of that. Right? And if I sneeze on this gently, that will go away. It won't actually keep doing that. And I think if I actually turn this, the optimizations off, I may even be able to get it to do that, but not sure. Probably not. So like, like, this is the nasty thing about data races. Right? They, they tend to work, but they are buggy code. And so how do we catch them? Well, we catch them with a sanitizer. So if we sanitize our threads, or thread, uh, we'll get a new binary that will do something truly amazing. Okay, so this is what this is called TSAN or Thread Sanitizer, and it's going to essentially tell you about your data race, and it does so in, in, in the most amazingly detailed way. So it says you have a data race here. Here is a write of a certain size and a stack trace for that write on one thread. Here is a previous write of a certain size and a stack trace of that write. It says these are unsynchronized; they form a data race according to C++. This is a bug. It tells you where this memory was allocated. It tells you how these threads were created. It tells you everything you need to know to understand this bug. Absolutely amazing tool. TSAN is essentially giving you a very conservative model of the C++ memory model, right? And every time you violate the strict semantics that the language guarantees, TSAN is going to tell you. So if you're writing multi-threaded code, I strongly encourage you to use TSAN. It, it, it finds the worst bugs, right? It's, and the most important bugs. Make sense? All right. OK, so, so that, that's all wonderful. That's all good and wonderful. But I've talked a lot about kind of correctness tools. There's some other tools here as well. So next up, I want to talk to you. There are other sanitizers, by the way. There's, there's an undefined behavior sanitizer. There are a lot of other tools. But I'm going to skip over those in the interest of time and try and get to, to the last uh, set of tools I want to talk about. And this is a very new set of tools that you may not have heard about. How many folks here have heard of thin LTO? handful, right? Thin LTO is a new technology that's being developed in LLVM. And this is the kind of technology you get when you actually can take ownership of a tool chain, right? Download, build, and install it, right? And actually use it right out of the, the upstream community. You get access to things like Thin LTO. So, so we're going to do something a little bit crazy. So I have not just like a trivial little thing here. I actually have a multi-file benchmark. So I have this annoying piece of code called f. f is a really annoying function. 
if x is really big, it actually like does IO, okay? But otherwise, it divides by 13. Like, no big deal, just divide by 13, right? So this is a very interesting function. Now, now it's, it, it's, it's, I, I don't actually care about divide by 13, but this kind of pattern is very common, where you have some error condition or some unexpected condition, and you do a bunch of work in that case, but almost always you have a very, very clear hot path that's super simple, right? And this function kind of models that pattern. And we're gonna be calling it from another function. So here I have a benchmark. So, so I don't know if you saw my talk at CppCon up on YouTube, because it's a great talk, about benchmarking, but you should check it out. There's a great library that I talk about called Google's Benchmark Library that allows you to write really nice kind of focused microscopic benchmarks for the hottest parts of your code, right? For the, for the, the things that really, really matter to the performance of your system. So here we've kind of benchmarked calling f. But not just calling f in any way, but calling f in a particular way that maybe matters for our system. And, and the particular way that matters here is that we, we, we call f very, very frequently with some multiple of 13, you don't know what multiple, but some multiple of 13 that remains small, right? And when we look at the definition of x, we're going to bypass all the I.O. and divide by 13, right? This is very unfortunate. They're in different files, right? And so, so if you compile and optimize this code, traditionally, the optimizer is going to be unable to do anything to speed this code up, okay? So let's look at what actually happens when we build this code. Uh, oh. Let's see if I can remember how to build this code. Okay, so, so building this code is a little bit trickier than, than some of the other things we've been building. So we have demo one. We also need to build our, our actual, uh, our other files. We're gonna build both files at the same time. We're gonna we'll write out the executable with a different name because we're actually really interested in how it behaves. We are gonna, we're gonna optimize, right? We're gonna optimize here. I'll even, I'll even, I'll optimize as hard as I know how to, okay? And, and then I need to, I need to actually like uh, get the, the uh, library that I'm using, the benchmark library, so I have to do a little bit of quick surgery here. Okay, so hopefully that works. Uh, there we go, delightful, okay. So now I have my slow demo. If I run this benchmark, very nice benchmarking framework, it's gonna run it for a bunch of iterations and compute a really accurate kind of speed here, right? And, and this, this, this is, you know, it's not too bad, right? Like, like 2.8 milliseconds, but like maybe we can do better. And, and keep in mind, right, like the, the code is doing, you know, a thousand of these things, right? But that's actually, that's actually kind of slow because this should be fast, right? The only thing we're calling it with is a multiple of 13. The only thing we're doing is dividing by 13. Like, this should be free, this should, this should be instantaneous. Why is this actually having any overhead at all? And the reason is that they're in separate files, and so the optimizer can't see between them. Now, there, there are traditional techniques for doing this called link time optimization, or whole program optimization, or in Windows, link time code generation, but they have a lot of scaling limitations. They tend to be uh, very slow, they tend to be very challenging to deploy, especially on larger applications. And so the LLVM uh, community has been developing uh, this technology called ThinLTO, which tries to scale up link time optimization in a really nice way. And the thing I love is how easy it is to use. So, so if I go through here and I just, I just say like, I wanna build this, you know, not slow, but fast. Okay, it's not, I can't just rename it, but. You can just do FLTO equals thin, all right? And you think like, Will that be enough? Well, if I try it, I'm gonna get some weird error messages. The linker blew up on me, okay? And this is an important thing to realize. We need an entire tool chain, right? If you build GCC yourself and you didn't build bin utils, right, you're gonna run into problems like this where the technology in your compiler isn't available in the linker. But we actually built a full tool chain and it includes a linker called LLD. And you can pass a flag to use it. So I can say F use LD equals LD, just use the linker called LLD. When I build like this, all of a sudden then LTO starts working. This is actually using LLD um, under the hood, which is a very, very nice linker. If, if we have extra time, I'll, I'll show you stuff about LLD. But let's, let's, let's run my benchmark. Ah, uh, no. So 
So our slow one is 2.8 milliseconds. Microseconds, thank you, microseconds. Wow, so that's a little bit faster. <laughs> All right, so, so we got like what, 4x faster here? And the reason is because now the compiler can optimize between these two translation units, all right? And, and it can do this at any scale. So you can put this in your build system. You can do this at any real scale. You can build Clang and Elvian themselves with this flag. Uh, we're building the, the Chromium browser with these, with these kind of flags. Inside of Google, we're even building bigger pieces of software. Apple is using this to build some large components of, of uh, the, the Mac operating system. Right? This is absolutely a production quality thing you can deploy. It scales very, very well, and it gets you amazing performance improvements. Traditionally, to get this kind of performance improvement, you actually have to like restructure your code and put stuff up in the header file and split it into two functions. And sometimes that's still the right call, right? You, you may even help. You may want to document, here's the fast path, here's the slow path, right? I don't want to tell you to stop doing that. But you should use the compiler technology you have to, to only do it when it's a good idea for code health, when it makes your code more readable, when it makes your code better fundamentally. Right? There are a lot of cases where the compiler can just fix this for you. ThinLTO is an incredibly powerful tool for that. So I've got like one minute left, and I want to show you very, 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 very quickly an even cooler thing that ThinLTO lets you do. But this is, I, I, I do apologize, this is going to go backwards a little bit. I'm going to go back to looking at bugs. So what if I have this weird type hierarchy? The base class, the virtual function, right? I have two overrides of this, right? And I, I have functions that call it, okay? Very simple virtual type hierarchy. We, we okay on time? Okay, okay. I'll be fast. So if I look at the call, like call A and call B are super boring. They just, they just take a reference to the derived thing and they call F. There's, there's nothing interesting going on here. So all the interesting stuff happens here. So here I actually implement F of both derived types, right? They are different. Right? And here I have a lovely main function, which does something a little bit bad. So I, I have this, this, this reinterpret cast. This is a bad idea. You don't like, re no one likes reinterpret cast, right? But, but this can sneak into your code in ways that are very, very hard to spot. And it can even, even happen just due to random memory corruption. And this is a scary thing, because if I compile this code, it's actually going to work, which is, which is a little bit like terrifying to me, right? So, Let's quickly compile this code. No. So, compile this code, use all my fancy tools, right? And I run this binary, and it actually runs. It doesn't crash, but it calls the wrong function. Okay, and that's really, really scary because if, if, if this, because we did call B here, right? So we did call B, but the function we actually called was A, right? And this is scary because this is how an attacker can exploit your binary. This is literally how attackers like to exploit your binaries. They write some bad piece of memory, and, right? And then you do a virtual function call and you end up in the wrong place with the wrong arguments and your binary's been exploited. This is, this is a huge component of modern exploits of, of software. But when we're using ThinLTO, and only when we're using ThinLTO, we have an amazing facility available to us. We can do f sanitize equals CFI. Okay, and this is called control flow integrity, um, specifically forward control flow integrity. And when you run CFI, uh, you also have to limit your visibility because it has restrictions. So you can't use CFIs easily from dynamic shared objects, but you can use it when you're building your binary. Okay? And now when I run this binary, it doesn't call A, it crashes. Right? This isn't a terribly helpful uh, error message because this sanitizer is different from the other ones. This one is not meant just to actually uh, catch bugs or to use in debugging. This one you can ship to production, right? It's actually a hardening or mitigation technique. And it is designed that way, okay? It's designed to be very minimal, very precise, and something you can actually put out in production. If you need help debugging it, you can use a flag to turn that off. No sanitized trap equals CFI, I think. And 
then it'll actually give you this nice error message saying control flow integrity check, check for type derived B failed um, when, I, when it was cast to an unrelated type, right? And this unrelated type is actually derived A in this case, right? So this is an amazing tool, right? This is incredibly impactful in terms of hardening. And it's built on top of all of these other things. It's built on top of the sanitizing ideas. It's built on top of ThinLTO to give us global information when we're building a binary to understand the type hierarchies that relate in this way. And, and it's using a very, very modern tool chain. So this is the kind of thing you can do when you actually take control of your tool chain. Um, I have like the world's worst slides to finish up. So summary, C++ is moving faster. Toolchain has to catch up, right? C++ toolchains are actually just software. Don't be afraid of them. If you hack on C++ software, you can hack on your toolchain, okay? So start using and hacking on LLVM. You can actually probably deploy it. I did it during this talk and then live demoed like eight different technologies. So you can actually do this. It's not this mystical hard thing and I hope you all go off and try and build LLVM yourself and you have a great time writing C++ code with it. All right, so how much time do I have for questions? 50 minutes? A whole 50 minutes? I ran over by like four minutes. Okay. But let's, let's take questions. Any questions? Uh, Cross-compiling, uh, cross great question. I didn't even mention this, and I should have. So Clang and LLVM are somewhat different from GCC. If you build them, they are cross-compilers. Okay, so for example, and since I have live demo, I will simply, well, maybe I will prove my point. So this Clang binary, uh, let's see, uh, what was one of the, let me, let me look at one of, the, one of the things I did just, actually no, here we go. Let's go to my demo. I can't run it, right? But if I actually do target equals, oh, this, has, this uses a library. Uh, where's my msand demo? So th this Clang binary that I built already targets like ARM. Oh, but ARM doesn't support memory sanitizer. Anyways. And I don't have a linker, but. Nope. LLD doesn't have enough support for, for ARM64 yet. But this compiler actually has support for ARM, right? The only thing that ran into issue here is a linker. If I had an ARM64 linker installed, it'd be fine. I think the ARM64 port for LLD is still, still being brought up. Make sense? Uh, you need, I mean, you need, you need lots of things, but like uh, building the standard library can happen. So, so for example, we built a standard library both for 64-bit x86 and also for 32-bit x86 when I did my install, right? Um, I think with a little bit more work when installing, you can actually install a standard library for ARM, uh, ARM as well. Uh, but you will need some system libraries, right? You're gonna need some kind of like host system. You're gonna need a libc. Uh, the, the tool chain is not 100%, right? It's the C++ layer. You're going to essentially need the C system layer to already exist, right? That's, that's, that's the unfortunate reality. We'd actually love to have this all in LLVM, but that, that's a much larger project. Other questions? One at the back. Uh, what's the difference between Clang Modernize and Clang Tidy with the Modernize? What is the difference between Clang Modernize and Clang Tidy with the Modernize checks? Uh, not much. Clang Modernize is where all of that was developed originally. Um, but we've been moving more and more things into the kind of Clang Tidy framework because it's integrated in a lot more places. And so, so the expectation is that more and more things will move into Clang Tidy, and Clang Modernize will probably kind of you know, retire and sunset after a while. But there's no real, there's no real push to get rid of it. Jason. Uh, for the record, uh, Google ships a compiler uh, once a week on average, built from head of master of upstream LLVM. And, and by ships, I mean like we deploy it and production services begin building with it. So sure, but like do some testing. Testing's still important because it's just, it's, it's just software, right? You could have bugs, but there's no particular reason to be afraid of master. The question is, is there anything like cross entry for generating the LLVM toolchain? Not really, because we don't want it to be more steps. 
So what we want to do is the, the steps I just ran, we want to extend to cover more and more cross-compiling uh, use cases. Uh, and right now, like, like it works really well for x86. It doesn't work as well for ARM and PowerPC and a couple of other platforms, but that's something where I think there's a lot of interest in the community. Uh, we don't, like, and certainly the compiler, it's, like, it's always a cross-compiler. There isn't, there isn't this distinction that you need to kind of package multiple compilers or multiple tools up. Uh, the, the, the linker is always a, a cross-linker. Other questions? Um, just on community, how big is the actual computing community? Oh my goodness, I don't even remember. Uh, and, and I was just at the developers meeting where they gave the stats for it. But like, I would say you know, uh, many tens of very active developers, right? Maybe not hundreds of very active developers. Certainly hundreds of developers, though, total. And, and many hundreds of, of very active users. It's, it's a pretty big community. Uh, so, so on Linux, because libstud++ is the default standard C++ library on Linux, it does continue to use it, particularly because of ABI reasons. Uh, there's a flag to switch to using libc++. Um, you can actually build Clang in a way where it will default to libc++ if you want. My two questions actually, how do you stay compatible with Linux? How do we stay compatible with libstud++? Uh, a lot of work. Um, some terrible hacks. There's, okay, don't tell, don't tell anyone that I'm telling you this, but like, there's a place inside of Clang's Lexer where if we see a certain token in a certain file name that happens to be an old version of libstud C++, we say, no, we didn't see that token. We saw this other token instead. <laughs> it's awful, right? Sometimes you have to do horrible things, but it's important to us because that's how we get users, right? That's how we interoperate. Right, libstud C++ is the ABI of most of the C++ libraries you have on your system. We, we have to stick with that. Absolutely not. In fact, my company has done that, and it's awesome. No, no, I, it's, a great, it's a great thing to put into code review system. It can take a lot of work, but most of the work isn't around the linting. Most of the work is actually around the build system, because you have to have some way of communicating to the linting stuff how to build your source code. And typically, it's the build system that knows that. And so, so, so I just ran it on the command line, which is kind of a cheat. Uh, but there's, if you, if you go and read the documentation about Clang Tidy, there's just a, a host of ways you can kind of plug your build system in. And if you have a good way of plugging your build system in, then you should be able to integrate it into a lot of places. And it's really valuable when you do. Yeah? When you're on the 10 LTS stuff, is there any way of printing out what it's actually improving on? Can you get a list of errors or anything like that? Is there a way, when you're running thin LTO, is there a way of printing out what it's improving on? So, so what's optimizing better or worse? So, so you keep saying errors of the code. The optimizer doesn't optimize errors of your code, right? Like, and so, so, so there's, there's no way for it to actually help you out here. If you want to find errors, you need something like the sanitizers. That's what the sanitizers are there for. They're there to diagnose bugs in the code. The optimizer, like, most of the errors are not errors in your code. They're actually errors in the intermediate state of the optimizer that another part of the optimizer introduced because it knew it could, and a later phase saw and was like, oh, cool, you were allowed to do that, I'm allowed to do this other thing, right? That's not a useful bug report. There was no bug on your code. And the, the, the ratio of these is like a million to one. And so, so having the optimizer print out every time it relies on an assumption isn't helpful because that's all of the time and only a very tiny fraction of the more bugs in your code, right? And that's why we have the sanitizers that actually look at your source code and the semantics. They don't, they don't just look at the optimizer. They actually look at the semantics of your source code and try and discover when there was actually a bug in the original code, right? And, and that, that's the best technique we found. And if you want to find this, the undefined behavior sanitizer is absolutely amazing. We think it covers the overwhelming majority of undefined behavior that isn't covered by a, a separate larger tool like address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, or thread sanitizer. Um, all of the little things that you might get wrong, it tries to cover. Yes. Um, do you have any recommendations of when and where to run Clang Tidy? So I'm thinking, for example, we could run them over the Unix SD, and you can therefore find more charts as far as RAM and just run it on stuff from the back. I mean, I would, I like all of the above. Um, so, so definitely run it on your unit tests. That's great, right? Try running it on some production data. You'll find more bugs. 
It's very hard to run a lot of the sanitizers on production data because they, they, they have high cost, right? So address sanitizer, for example, is going to use a tremendous amount of your virtual address space, tremendous amount of memory, and it's slow. You may not be able to do that in production, and that's okay, right? And so, so you don't want to get hung up on that, but if you can run like a canary or like a, a filtered mirror of your production traffic against you know, a, an address sanitized binary, that's great. The other thing to think about, though, is that sanitizers are not hardened. Like, unless they specifically say so kind of on the tin. CFI is special here. There are a couple of others that are designed to run in production. Most of them aren't really designed that way, and so they may not be a great thing to deploy globally because they may have their own vulnerabilities, or they may be systematically making your code easier to exploit in order to catch certain classes of bugs. Um, and, and, and you don't really want to push that into production. It, it, they are more debugging tools than production tools. Um, ASAN probably comes the closest of like straddling this fence, um, and it still is pretty challenging to deploy production in production. Hello at the end's uh, umbrella for a lot of projects. I um, would like to hear a little bit more about Little Fuzzer, or there was one I heard a super optimizer project. Where are they at? So, 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 so the, the question is there, there are a bunch of projects in LLVM, right? And, and It'd be interesting to talk about some of the other ones, and there are two that you mentioned, which is uh, the fuzzing tools and super optimizers. So, so the fuzzing tools are easy. So the fuzzing tools are built on top of sanitizers in LLVM, but I, I would need a whole other hour to kind of talk about those. Fortunately, the colleague of mine who built the fuzzing tools gave that talk at CppCon, and it's recorded, and it'll be up on YouTube in a matter of weeks or months. So go check out that talk. Um, I, I think it's Fuzz or Lose is the title. Um, and it's a great overview of what's going on with fuzzing. The super optimizer stuff is interesting. Uh, so super op the, there's not a super optimizer that's part of the LLVM project, but there are a large number of uh, people in academia doing research on compiler optimizations using a technique called super optimization, which if people don't know is essentially brute force optimization uh, which is infeasible to do in, in kind of like online, instead doing it offline and, and kind of using that to learn what is missing from the optimizer. Uh, and, and there are several different academics looking at this. John Reger has is, is, is looked at this several times in the past. There are a few other people who have. But none of that's in the LLVM project proper. It's mostly in the research community that's been worked on. Yes. Is there anything in the back of the or should I? I mean, in the sense that you could put it outside of the open end brackets to create an artificial state and that sort of thing? It's really syntactic sugar. But like, it's, it's an important syntactic sugar because it's a syntactic sugar that reduces indentation right, and narrows scopes, two things that are very hard to put up with when writing code manually. So, so the question is, can you, can, is there anything coming to allow you to ignore a piece of, of the structure that you're binding? Um, you could always just use a name that you ignore as a, as a hypothetical. But uh, yeah, the committee is very interested in this. Uh, there, there are a lot of ideas about it. Um, so, some folks have proposed uh, terribly clever ideas. That, uh, if, you, if you subtly change the scoping rules, you can just use underscore and it works. But let, let, like, I, I think we need to let the committee figure that one out. Last question, and then I got to get out for this stage. What do we have? Anything going once? All right. Uh, the cool thing about LLD, I was going to show you, but I definitely don't have time to show you now, is that LLD as a linker is incredibly fast. So, 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 so your your standard linker on Linux is is based on BFD. Um, which is very, very slow uh, because it supports a tremendous number of platforms and uses a lot of abstraction layers to do that. There's a, a new linker for Linux called Gold that was developed fairly recently that's like two times faster, which is great. LLD is two times faster than Gold, at least. So, so if you have big binaries, it's way faster. And you just pass the flag F use LD equals LLD, and it works. I was going to like show you linking stuff and benchmark it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.